Carlos Watson is uh, going to be the next moderator, despite what your program says, and he's one of the coolest guys around. He's been like in what we would call four estates. He was in the uh, public sector. He was in the nonprofit sector when he did Achieva College Prep, which he co-founded. Uh, when I was in uh, the cable news business, he has been one of the great rising stars there, was an anchor at MSNBC, and now he's a managing director at one of our sponsors, Goldman Sachs. It's my pleasure to present my friend Carlos Watson. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good afternoon. Oh, that's a little tepid. Good afternoon. Hey guys, I've got a great panel for you, but I'm not giving it up unless people are excited about it. Good afternoon. We're halfway there. All right, we're going to hand out drinks soon. Um, um, I'm really pleased to be here, and while our panel has a very fancy name, at the heart of it is are we or are we not at a moment um, of, of meaningful change in education? Will real education reform happen, or will we just be having a repeat of the same conversation it feels like we've had at least over the last 40 plus years, every five or six years. Um, three terrific and very interesting people to come and, and join you and talk about it. Uh, Barry O'Callaghan is chief executive of Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, uh, one of the largest educational players, not only in the country, but across the world. Um, Barry, interestingly enough, grew up in a small town uh, in Ireland, uh, didn't follow the education path that he thought he would have, and I'll let him tell you about it. Um, before you know it, he was, uh, he was cursed to be a banker and realized that rather than be a banker, uh, he wanted to be an entrepreneur, and particularly an entrepreneur in the education space, and over the last decade plus has built up an incredibly interesting business that he'll talk to you about today. So Barry O'Callaghan um, is someone who's in the space, and we'll have particularly interesting ways to talk about whether or not we're at a moment of change. We'll also be joined by someone who's in the corporate space and who probably thinks about this from a... Uh, even larger 30,000-foot view. Uh, Dr. Ed Amoroso is a uh, self-described geek and son of geeks and uh, brother of geeks. Um, his father was probably one of the first to get a Ph.D. in computer science. Uh, he did the same uh, working at Bell Labs. Um, ultimately uh, spent north of 20 years uh, teaching, so comes at it from that perspective as well. Um, also has sat on his local board of education and today is a senior vice president at and So yet another perspective on educational change. And last but not least, if we've got an operator in the space and we have a, uh, um, a corporate power who's, uh, who's thinking about the space, we certainly need a uh, philanthropist and a flamethrower. And so I couldn't think of anyone better than Mark Echo. If, uh, if you've got any bit of fashionista in you at all, you know who Mark Echo is. Over the last uh, decade plus, he's built an incredible company along with his partners north of a billion dollars in revenue, several different brands under Mark Echo Enterprises. But Mark has also come to care deeply about education, has been very involved in it, not only as a father, um, but has been involved as a philanthropist over the last 10 years, and I think you'll be intrigued with what he has to say. So without uh, further ado, uh, the cast of uh, Jersey Shore, uh, Snooky J. Wow in the situation, come on up. Guys, cool, good stuff. Great. Is this the order? That's yeah. it. Looks like a good order to me. Cool. Open right. bar in the back. <laughs> Great. Um, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to spend uh, a half hour going back and forth with uh, this terrific crew um, on the question of whether or not this is a moment for genuine education reform and dramatic change. And then I want to open it up because I think as good as the conversation that we'll have here, I think it'll get even better when we get the folks out there and the audience involved. Um, but to kick things off, uh, we may end up being a little bit provocative today. I asked each of, uh, of the folks here to share kind of a minute or less about how they came to uh, this issue of education reform and education change, what made it uh, worth their while, what made them interested in it, what created some passion around it. So Mark Echo... Uh, son of Lakewood, New Jersey. I turn to you first. How did, right. uh, how did someone who was focused on uh, well, building a big consumer brand start to care about education? Uh, I think I probably was focused on, 
you know, learning far before I was thinking about building a big consumer brand. Um, I just reflect back on the learning that happened, you know, in Lakewood, New Jersey, growing up in, in the 80s, you know, uh, when, uh, you know, pre-desktop publishing boom, um, in a very culturally and ethnically diverse uh, environment. Um, I really was a product of my environment, and uh, I, I got into airbrushing at a young age. For me, some folks, you know, might have got a sax or learned how to play the piano or basketball. You know, my, uh, you know, my engagement uh, um, with an extracurricular activity or vocation, if you will, was uh, my airbrush. It was, a, it was a, me painting and hustling and being an entrepreneur. And it was emotionally very gratifying. And in, in, uh, even though I, I was an above average you know, student, maybe a, a far below average school, um, uh, it was the thing that kind of acted as the narrative pathway for me to learn. Um, and when uh, I started my business after I dropped out of college in 1993, uh, I uh, started my business um, uh, uh, ha uh, having left Rutgers College of Pharmacy. Um, uh, it was because That's I was... That's a little breaking news. You yeah. were on your way to being a pharmacist? Yeah, it was, you know, drugs. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Did you expect Pharmaceuticals. market? Pharmaceuticals. Okay, yeah. good, okay. I had All the right. left brain chops. You know what, we, uh, we appreciate both brains. you know about brains. Brains. organic good. medicinal chemistry? Not much. Right, Not I, much. neither do I. Okay, okay. Right. All right. So the, the, uh, the, the long and short of it is... Um, I started my business and I uh, went on a real treacherous road, ups and downs, and you know uh, the culture of my company and my partners, having my partner being my twin sister Marcy and another gentleman by uh, the name of Seth Gertzberg, we had this crazy idea of committing money that we didn't have to philanthropy before we had it. And that became a pursuit for us to have to earn for other reasons. Uh, uh, I uh, ended up being, I think it was at an Aspen Institute event or something out in, in Colorado. I ended up meeting with a guy named uh, Elliot Washer, who's uh, Dennis Lipke from the Big Picture uh, Schools. Uh, and I had been doing uh, some investigating on where I wanted to apply myself philanthropically in the States. And education became the, uh, the gateway. Uh, and I went on to create Sweat Equity Education, which was really kind of me reimagining, uh, you know, a vocational education around consumer product, right? The magic that happens when you open up that FedEx pack mm -hmm. and what you ideated versus what you get when the sample comes in and it's all wrong, mm -hmm. and the learning that happens between those beats is really powerful. So what if, just what if you could distill that and productize that into a curriculum? And that's been the focus of sweat equity education and, uh, uh, you know, um, been very, very uh, personally gratifying. But now I'm in a place where having kind of felt like a bit, a little bit, excuse my French because I probably will end up cursing more than once today, um, but a little bit of a pissing contest um, in the philanthropic space, I've now arrived at a feeling where uh, I think we could do, um, uh, be more disruptive in a creative way uh, by maybe applying some of the energy, my know-how around branding, marketing, speaking to young folks, um, to uh, innovate uh, in a, in a for-profit model as well. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to hold it there because I, I want to jump into some of that when we talk about whether or not this is the moment, and if so, how we capture it. Uh, uh, Barry, uh, you are international representative uh, stuck between two New Jersey guys. How did you come to caring about education reform education change, <coughs> dramatic education change in the United States. What was, uh, what was your path? Sure. Well, it's great to be here. Um, yes, I am a foreign national sitting between two New Jersey boys, mm -hmm. so that'll keep me honest. Watch uh, what you said. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but I like Bruce Springsteen. Does that, does that count? No. Um, Counts. <laughs> that's a little harsh. I think I might have got the audience on that one. Um, so, as you've kind of touched uh, in your intro, I suppose the early part of my career displayed a, a tremendous uh, ability to you know, make bad decisions or at least a refusal to make a, kind of decisions for the long term. So I grew up in rural Ireland, son of a doctor, two older brothers became doctors. The only thing I knew at the end of high school was I didn't want to become a doctor, so I went to law school. The only thing I knew at the end of law school was I didn't want to be a lawyer, so I went to Wall Street. <laughs> After eight or nine years of Wall Street, I realized this is really not for me. 
and kind of stumbled my way bluntly into education. Uh, and you know, I like to joke that I'm year 13 of my two-year project. Mm -hmm. because, and what I've learned in that 13 years is that the most important rule in education is that it's not a get-rick-quick uh, environment. So for any budding entrepreneur in the audience, uh, it is a very rewarding environment. I do believe we're at a tipping point, which we're going to come on to discuss. Uh, but it is not something that, that's a get-rich-quick strategy. I mean, there are other easier areas to go into in life. Um, but I enjoy it. I think it's rewarding, and I do think we're at the tipping point. I mean, my background specifically when I got into education was I got involved in a small little Irish startup that had developed a prototype piece of software identifying middle school math from the TIMS. Uh, back in the mid-90s as being the area of worst underperformance in the U.S. education system. And we took that, we took that little piece of software, prototyped it, um, I raised some capital, as you'd expect the next Wall Street guy to do, and kind of put the company on a sustainable footing. And I suppose really the journey for that company called Riverdeep started when I took it public. So the day NASDAQ broke 5,000 was the day I took that company public, raised $150 million for a company that had done less than a couple of million in <laughs> revenue. And then I had capital, which is the first thing any entrepreneur needs. And the second thing is I had a product. Uh, albeit not nearly enough of it, uh, certainly not enough of it to grow into a $2 billion market cap, which is what we were capitalized on the first day we went public. <laughs> and the third thing I had was an overvalued currency. So for the course of three years at Riverdeep, I rolled up a whole bunch of what I thought were great education companies from a product perspective. So I bought the learning company, bought Broderbund, bought Edmark from IBM, and really gave myself the, the hardest thing about education, which was some scale. And then I suppose you could argue the kind of the controversial move, and certainly there's been rhetoric over the course of the morning around, you know, are the textbook guys part of the problem? And bluntly, I, I thought they were, and that's why, frankly, I bought two of them, and that's why we're changing them, because I think, you know, they were part of the old guard, but they're actually leading into the new guard. And certainly for all of you in the audience who've got a great product, who've got a great idea, I come in peace as a foreign national, and I believe the <laughs> thing we can give you is we can give you distribution, because it is hard to sell to 100,000 school buildings in America, and it's even harder to sell to lots of geographies around the world. So bought Houghton in, in 2006, bought Harcourt in 2007, put the second, fourth largest traditional publishers together with the largest electronic publisher that I'd built up at Riverdeep. And really, through August 2008, as the principal shareholder of that business, I looked very smart. Mm. And since then, I've looked very stupid. <laughs> um, but uh, the reality is... Story that, of education. Yeah, exactly. Huh? It's cycles of life. Uh. And, and you, frankly, you learn more on the, <clears throat> you know, from the downward cycles than from the upward ones. But you know, I'm very proud today of what we have. Because as I said, I think we have a you know, a platform that, frankly, is a platform for all of you to use. Um, I think we are at a tipping point and a really interesting inflection point and an interesting time. Um, but obviously, there are some structural and some funding issues that are going to have to get addressed to, uh, to make that happen. Dr. Ed Amoroso, you, uh, you've tackled education from a couple of different seats, a couple of different vantage points. But I really like what you shared with me this morning about kind of not only your, but your family right. Uh, right. travel towards caring about education and thinking about this yeah. issue. Yeah, I had... Uh, Four grandparents that all came over from Italy, uh, none of them finished grade school, and the culture that they created for my parents and for myself, my brothers and sisters and cousins, is one very steeped in education. I know that um, sometimes when people don't have education, uh, they may go, you can kind of go any, any one of a number of different directions. Sometimes you can be very anti uh, education, but my grandparents, that was never the idea. My, my two grandfathers felt that engineering and building things and science was about the best thing you could ever do. Um, so my dad became an engineer, his brothers became engineers, I'm an engineer, my brother's an engineer, my sister, we, we all sort of went in that direction because that's the culture that uh, we were sort of pushed into, uh, but, but willingly. It was sort of something that um, you know, really was nurtured. Uh, one of the themes that we can talk about um, you know, in the next hour or so is how that culture towards science and technology and engineering, in some cases, may have morphed a little bit. You know, that burning passion that my grandparents felt about youngsters becoming engineers. I wonder if that, um, if that burning passion um, is as strong in 2011 as it was maybe back in the uh, 30s and 40s. So uh, look forward to chatting with you all about that. Great. Uh, Mark, I'm going to turn to you first. Uh, as you've looked at education, gotten more steeped in it over the last 10 years, I know there have probably been a couple of times where you've been hopeful and you've thought that we might be at a tipping point and something big may be happening and changing education. Uh, is there anything that makes you feel like today that we are genuinely at a moment where education is about to? I like the, the phrase you use, not reformed but reimagined. Well, you know, I, I'm hopeful and and 
wide-eyed. And, you know, it's hard as you get older, you become more cynical. Uh, I remember, you know, when I first got into the space and I'd be all fired up and talking to, you know, lifers in the ed space and, the, you know, these lifer reformer types with, you know, scars on their face. Um, and they would say, yeah, I remember I used to feel the same way, kid, but you'll see. It's too much to have to go through the bureaucracy, you know, and it's just kind of, you know, I, you know, fight through that. And I, I definitely over the last few years um, have gotten more, uh, um, more hopeful. I mean, I think there have been some decent optics in the media. Uh, I do think, though, um, as we wait for Superman, uh, the conversation is still very inside baseball. And if we think about really what mainstream Americans know on this topic... If uh, I were to pull anyone off the street and have invited them here amongst us, I think, I think they'd think we were speaking another language. And uh, I think that's a great deal of the problem. It's a, it's a lot of conversation amongst adults. Um, not enough conversation amongst the children, future voters. And uh, there's uh, too much uh, eggshells, too much, you know, kind of tiptoeing on, uh, you know, some of the fundamentals that just don't reflect a free market, democratic society. All right, know? breaks break some of the shells, break some of the eggs. Oh, goodness. You really want me to? Why not? I mean, I, I, yeah, we of course want to, I do, want don't to. we? Yeah. Well, look, I don't, uh, I'm not trying to pick a fight, but, you know, <laughs> I'm not afraid of one. Um, I do think that if this is the civil rights movement of our time, we have to uh, um, be a little bit more willing uh, to uh, increase the tone of urgency I think private sector, it's incumbent on us. You know, I, you know I'm, I'm successful, you know, uh, but I, I'm not Google rich. Uh, and it would certainly help if the Google rich folks would kind of, you know, tune up uh, uh, the rhetoric a little bit uh, and help uh, for us to collectively work together and more efficiently use our, our resources when we're doing uh, marketing initiatives. You know, I've sat with Bill and Melinda Gates, you know, when they launched Ed in 08. Uh, I was hopeful then, you know, I, I, I was hopeful with the new administration, um, but um, I don't think we've had that buckle up for safety moment. We haven't had that Smokey the Bear moment, and it needs to feel a little bit more like a food fight than uh, how it currently feels, and I don't think we're going to get there until we're not going to legislate, negotiate, you know, contract, legal it up, you know, we're not, we're not going to voucher it, we're not going to charter school our way to what's fundamentally a product offering problem. Meaning that you, that you fundamentally feel that the, the curriculum, that what students learn at the end of the day, when you say a product problem. Look, Bill Gates didn't reform the iPod to the iPhone, right? <laughs> there wasn't reform built in there. That was, that was completely reimagining. And our industry, this industry, I should say, your industry, is so steeped in need for evidence and data points, which I get the rigor, I get that. But if I were to be handed a business plan that looks like, you know, 90% of the RFPs that are written for government grants around education, I'd throw up on them. Okay, it just doesn't look like the, uh, the kind of uh, private sector uh, demands uh, that we have in, in, in the private sector. We, we, in order to get to innovation, what we get, I think, is that it is an iterative process, that you have to allow for failure to happen in real time, that if you wait to get to such a critical mass of data points, 10, 20 years later where you're at scale, the market's changed. I'm going to pause you right there. Barry, jump in. Uh, fundamentally, what I hear Mark saying is that while he'd like to believe uh, that change is afoot and that we're at a tipping point, that, it, that unfortunately he doesn't. Do you agree with that? Do you agree that for all the hope for... I don't know that I don't. I don't know that I didn't say I did. You, I don't. You know, okay, all right. I don't, I don't, he, he's yeah. unclear then. At a minimum, yeah. he's unclear. <laughs> no, I think I agree with what he really did say, which is we are at a tipping point. <laughs> okay. Uh, as to whether we avail of the tipping point and we go down the right ah, road is okay. a different question. I mean, look, bluntly, let's call out the facts. I mean, the facts are, you know, 
intuitively and at, at, at its simplest, education, good education is, is quite simple, right? Appropriate parental involvement combined with good teachers and principals that administrate a building well will give you great outcomes. It doesn't matter the ethnicity of the child, the socioeconomic background of the child, okay? That's an easy statement. I know it's a truism. I know educators in the audience will find it frustrating, but it's something we oftentimes lose sight of because today what we have in the U.S. is we've got a structural issue and a cultural issue. And culturally, I think oftentimes we give up we do this, and that's why it does, it does take people like Mark, optimists who frankly come in, as I did 13 years ago, with a bit of blind ignorance, but with optimism and hope and pre prepared to speculate some capital to create change. So, I mean, the first part of your question is, are we at a tipping point? I, I believe we are, but frankly, I also believe we have to be, because status quo will mean that your children in this room will work for Chinese companies and Indian companies and Singaporean companies, and America will not. And I love it. I may be a foreign national, but I lived here for several years. I continue to spend a lot of time here. It's a country I love and adore. But it will not survive in the global competitive marketplace unless it has a great education system. It is a great third-level education system, but it does not have a great primary and secondary education system. And bluntly, its third-level education system is increasingly being populated by non-Americans. Okay? So the fact of the matter is we can debate whether we are or we aren't or we should or we shouldn't be. We have to be. At a, at, a, at a point of change, because status quo is going to keep you, you know, 20, you know, 23rd in science, 25th in math, 20x in literacy, numeracy, you know. So, so the answer is, I think we are at a tipping point, and I think to be fair to the federal government in particular, they get that, and so a lot of these initiatives are, you know, trying to prescribe to the key issues. So whether it's STEM, whether it's race to the top, whether it's I3, you know, these are all great things, but they're all things that are ultimately you know, need to get addressed at source, because to my mind, we have the structural issue. And I mean, I heard a lot this morning about kind of product innovation. And frankly, we as a company and my former company, we did a lot of product innovation. I think there's a lot of great products out there, right? I think, well, though, what we need is structural innovation. And, and, and when you say structural, is that code for? Uh, That's uh, code for let's get the stakeholders together. So, so right. first of all, let's list them. So, you know, I've talked about, you know, the truism of education being at its simplistic best, pretty easy when you get parental involvement, good teachers, and, and drive outcomes. But now let's talk about where it gets complicated. Federal, state, local government, unions, public, private sector, right, um, foundations, philanthropists. Um, and so that's an awful lot of touch points. So when you put all of those variables into the Rubik's Cube, suddenly it's big and it's multidimensional and it's tough to, to kind of figure out how to get through it. What one or two things, if you were uh, uh, spending even more time with Secretary Duncan and spending time with President Obama and the Republican leadership, if you were to give them advice, here are two or three things that could push this tipping point moment uh, dramatically forward to the positive, what would you recommend? What would be your top two or three recommendations? Well, I mean, like any sector, like any business, we've got to put the entire industry and I'm not talking about the for-profit industry. I'm talking about the societal you know, provision of education to our children. We've got to put it on a long-term financeable foothold. But today, it's unfinanceable. I mean, the truth is we've seen more change in the last 18 months in our industry than we've seen in the prior 30 years. Why? Because we have a financial crisis. So it took a financial crisis to stimulate real political and policy debate, okay? That ain't going away anytime soon. So there may be an economic recovery going on. Dr. Greenspan sat in this chair this morning. He knows a lot more about that than me. But what we do know is for that to feed its way into state and local coffers is going to take a couple of years. So I think it's fair to say the economic backdrop to the, the marketplace is going to remain challenged for a couple of years. So the first thing I would do is I would avail of those couple of years to try and figure out what is the addressable market for education. Start to that number two to healthcare as a percentage of GDP and work it all the way down into how much goes on instructional materials. Because, you know, we can debate what the total addressable market size is. To my mind, it shouldn't, one to two percent of that pool shouldn't be allocated to instructional materials, with then only a piece of that being, instruct, being allocated to innovative products and services and offerings. So, I mean, I think there's a whole kind of systemic debate to be had between the various policymakers. So, I mean, if I were you know, Secretary Duncan, which is physically not possible for lots of reasons, including passport, mm -hmm. you know, what I would do is, you know, I would get the right policy uh, makers together. And importantly, represent all, you know, all stakeholders at the policy table. Uh, and, and frankly, you know, let's call out the elephant in the room. The, the unions have an opinion, right? Tenure is there. 
right? Let's, let's address accountability. You know, pay for performance is not something that the unions necessarily resist as much as we think at a headline level. I think it just needs to be presented in the form of what's the long-term vision for education. Because the one thing I think everybody in this room will agree to is America needs to rebuild its education system. 2020 seems like as good a target date as any. And getting graduation rates, I mean, we can agree the metrics by which we'll judge recovery. But we've enough time frame here, and we've got a two-year window where things aren't going to get any better. So we've got kind of the, we've got the backdrop of a crisis in which we can continue to, I think, drive change. And so then back to your question about what would I do, I'd bring a composium uh, uh, of the right stakeholders together. I would you know, drive the right debate. Uh, and then I would, frankly, you know, treat the people who administrate this, um, this marketplace like grown-up adults. You're, Mark's right. We should have more children you know, telling us what needs to happen, but we also need to empower these people. I mean, it's no coincidence that the places that are getting performance results and AYP results, great districts are administered by great leaders. And leaders who, frankly, I mean, there was a debate this morning about do you or don't you do what you're told. The great leaders just get on with doing what they know needs to be done. And so I think if we're going to raise the bar and demand greater accountability and demand greater results, well, then we've got to give these people greater flexibility. Make their budgets fungible. Make them decide how they want to spend their money, but hold them accountable and treat them like grown-up adults. Ed, how do, you, how do you see this from your vantage point? Are we, are we at a moment? Uh, and if we are, what are your thoughts about pushing that moment uh, forward? And if we're not, what are your thoughts? Well, you heard, a, you heard a minute ago about some of the things that have not changed and will never change. It's always true that parental involvement, great administrators, these things are great constants. But youngsters process information differently now. You know, I've been teaching for 20 years. I've probably had 2,000 graduates and undergraduates over the last two decades. And I can see just in them, and I, I spent some time uh, running the school district uh, where I live, I could see it in the youngsters that the idea that maybe in 1950 a bunch of youngsters would sit quietly without moving and pay attention to an authority up at a, in front of a room writing very slowly on a, on a blackboard, um, that, that sort of matched the way youngsters thought of authority at the time. In many cases, we have exactly the same model for teaching, say at the primary and even at the high school level, for youngsters who think totally differently. Go spend a, a, a couple of hours with one of your teenagers playing Halo on Xbox. I mean, the amount of image and the amount of information and back and forth that's processed, the amount of multiplex, multitasking. My son has a headset on. He's talking to kids around the world while he's playing. He's got one earpiece playing you know, music from his iPod, and he's probably doing homework at the same time. I mean, this is the way youngsters in 2011 process information and, and the reality is that we have not adapted to that at all. We, we've got a model that makes sense to a 50-year-old, um, and it just does not make sense to youngsters. So there are great constants. You're absolutely right that pa parents need to be involved. Needs to be a culture of education. Needs to be a seriousness about how important education is, not just to yourself, but obligation to your community and your country but, you know, once you establish those baseline issues, there really does need to be change. And the inflection point that I think is being alluded to here is that we need to identify what those changes are. And some of the very dynamic entrepreneurs in this room who are running different companies or some of the folks from government groups who make decisions about funding and about incentives and those of you and us in industry that have the ability to affect uh, change we better get to it, because this is long overdue. In the United States, we're falling behind. And I would say, I, you know, without sort of disparaging the globe, I don't think any country really has it right. I think there are problems just uh, pretty universally. And um, if there's one thing I would tell, um, you know, either the president or the secretary, it would be continue to nurture the things that are baseline and that will never change, culture and so on, but recognize that until we change the model of how we communicate with youngsters, um, we're going to continue to build a, a gap between how they process information and how we think it should be presented to them. Mark, what do you think about the role so far? So, so part of the good news, people could argue, over the last 10 years is that you've had a number of wealthy individuals, be it uh, Bill Gates, Rupert Murdoch, Michael Dell, 
others kind of weigh in in the way that some of the corporate chiefs did in the uh, 70s and 80s. And they've kind of weighed in with their own money, their own time, their own care, their own foundations. But how do you see it? Have they shaken things up in the way that you would have hoped? And, and if not, what does that make you think about the value of their participation going forward? I, I think, look, it's very meaningful to, to have a, a college dropout like Bill Gates involved. Uh, mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> all kidding aside, I think he's one of the most uh, philanthropic, um, you know, human beings on the earth, and do amazing work. And the Gates Foundation folks do amazing work. Um, but I think there uh, there is an element of um, uh, uh, of a lack of uh, of um, they wouldn't. The, the manner in which they're innovating in, their, in their, the Microsoft business and, and the, the speed to market and the drive for productizing uh, the, the change isn't necessarily in the, the, uh, the, the Gates Foundation in, in the same manner. I don't say that in a kind of begrudgingly pissy fashion. I, I mean it because they, they probably are dealing with the real day-to-day politics and on the ground and all the the logistics of that, and uh, certainly, uh, you know, more than ever, um, it's in the air. Uh, but, uh, you know, um, it's led me to think about, well, what, what can I do to maybe make a difference? So I want to indulge myself for a moment. Sure. I want to share with you a great piece of technology, great innovation that I've discovered. Hold on. Show and tell. It's a garbage can. So why am I bringing out a garbage can? Well, I don't know how many of you guys know what this is, but this is a paddle. These paddles are often named by educators. In 20 states, it is legal in this country to discipline children in schools by way of physical beating and paddling. 20 states. 30 states, if you were to hit or strike that child, would be called assault. In all 50 states in the Union, you can't hit a prisoner. So something is fundamentally wrong from a just like, let's all get in the sandbox for a minute. So much of this is beginning, middle, 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 middle. This is a great device for us to unite around, to say, you know what, this is a beginning and a middle and the end, right? We're gonna start by saying, you can't learn in a hostile learning environment. We don't want bullies in our school. Then why should we be teaching young people who are physically less enabled that a larger adult can strike them as a means of discipline? Okay, what, what happens when Mrs. Jones in third, in third period gives you your licks? How do you go back to class and reconcile that? How do your peers reconcile that? In a, a culture that needs to really look in the mirror uh, um, and is talking about innovation needs to start with the basics. It's harder to get a peanut into school than it is a paddle. Something wrong with that, folks. Okay, like it, something wrong with that. And I'm not talking about what you do at your home. This isn't a conversation around corporal punishment largely at home. And it, this is conversation that, uh, that I'm looking to elicit It's a digital platform that will be launching this spring called Unlimited Justice. And if, in fact, this is going to be the social justice issue of our time, education reform, we're going to try to get stakeholders, voters, future voters, teachers, real people talking and demanding for change. All right, now what if someone pushes back on you, Mark, and they say, I get the point. You're you're saying that 30 states, it's assault, 20 states, it's legal, that doesn't make a ton of sense, and it's representative of, of a, larger, uh, <laughs> a, a larger ineffectiveness, you'd say, injustice of our education system. But what if someone said, for all that being true, we've got more fundamental issues we've got to worry about today, and that that can't be the centerpiece. How's it working of, for you? How are those fundamentals working for you? The problem people would say is that the fundamentals haven't been focused on. They're right. not, they're they're, not, disagree, they're they're not, not the disagreeing with you. We, the, they're, they're, here's the thing. This is a non-academic barrier. Yeah. Okay, we could agree to disagree on Carnegie units and how you want to measure someone and evaluate their competency and their education. 
But the one thing that we should for certain agree on, that there's got to be better devices in disciplining our kids. I am not saying that we should go to anarchy, okay? But what does it say when we reflect on our system that we're talking here about innovation and putting more computers and smart boards into schools, often in situations where educators themselves can't get access to it or there's a lack of literacy amongst the educators in how to deploy the, these materials, right? If we're going to mainstream this conversation, have that change the light bulb, have a moment of like, you know, we did it, all right, it's step one, it's only the first ball on the first tee, okay, and there's a lot more work to do, and if we're going to talk about accountability, uh, to teacher accountability, it, this helps set us up for a conversation around student accountability, parent accountability. It's a lot of messy kitchen stuff that is involved in fixing the issues on hand. Okay, to your point, it's a complex Rubik's Cube. But when we can get to the basic things, like by a show of hands, how many people here think that it is okay for an educator to deploy physical punishment in a classroom upon a student? How many people here think it's okay? No one. How many people here think that corporal punishment should not exist in America? Sure. That's it? We're the, <laughs> the, uh, in, the, uh, the only industrialized country on the planet that still tolerates this. And for us not to see the connective tissue here, it's it, like kids, this is what kids are dealing with. It brings us, it takes the adults out of being an adult and getting comfort and being overly comfortable with the stuff we're talking about, okay? And it makes us think about what's it like on the ground? All right, pause. For, Barry, what, what do you hear? What do you hear when you, uh, when you hear Mark's, Mark's proposal and, and the fundamental issue that he raises here? Well, I think what Mark's talking to really is, is again, from my perspective, there's a dichotomy of two issues here. There's kind of a structural issue and a cultural issue. Cultural slash, we can call it an entitlement issue. So back to Dr. Greenspan this morning. You know, rich kids will always have, frankly, choice. Uh, and historically, poor kids had none. And then the real debate was around the people in the middle, right? Um, and of course, you know, I think that I applaud the federal government around SIG and lots of the other initiatives that are attacking the, the kind of the bottom. But the real issue was what about the kind of the 25th to 75th percentile? What, what, about, what about them? Uh, and to my mind, you know, the, to, to Mark's question and point, we, ha we are at a tipping point. People are certainly, I think, at a bipartisan level, uniting around status quo being unacceptable and the need to reform our education system and the need to get it up because people irrefutably understand it correlates to economic prosperity. Okay? So you know, parents love their kids. They recognize they need a functioning economy for their kids to be successful and happy in it. And the only way to do that is for the education system to improve and it becomes this virtual circle and cycle. So I think the cultural part of this is it wouldn't take a lot. It's the old first step in the long movement. It wouldn't take a lot to, I think, really prove it out to people that we are at this point, inflection point and, you know, the first step is going to be a positive step. And I actually do believe the not-for-profit sector can play a critical role in that because, bluntly, they can put things to the government at a federal and state level that the private sector can't. They can say, if you want our money, these are the rules by which you get it. Uh, and these are very important, very brilliant people who I think can lay down a marker because they've also got, frankly, the financial scale by which they have to be, to, to, to be listened to. So from my perspective, th that is something at a cultural level we can do. I suppose I probably spend more of my time thinking about it at a structural level, structural level around funding. Until we get this federal, state, local trichotomy and kind of, you know, disparity and lack of fungibility, we will always have massive inefficiencies embedded in the procurement process. And as long as that exists, it will always remain a tough marketplace for the private sector to make money in, right? Because you don't want a highly inefficient marketplace. Um, so so I, I think that's part of the structural issue is getting the funding right. The, the other issue is around data. And again, I applaud what the federal government are trying to do around this. I mean, you know, for any of, us, any of you in the room who've, had, who've been through a, a medical procedure or process yourself or have had a loved one that's gone through it, which I unfortunately went through with my wife over the last 12 months, the heart of the process is the diagnosis, okay? So, you know, you start, you're ill. Wh where does the process start? It starts with, you know, very significant technology-based testings, MRIs, CT scans, right? Lots of technology is used to give the world's leading physicians the ability to then make a diagnosis. And the diagnosis is the foundation 
to a prescriptive plan. So we have a glossary of new buzzwords in our, in our industry. Personalized learning and individualized instruction. You know, these things seem to be cyclical. I mean, they were the buzzwords of 99 when we had, you know, 1,000 e-learning companies that were going to be the next, you know, and, and, and uh, Cham Mr. Chambers from Cisco was being constantly quoted as education is going to be the next killer app. The good news is I think 10 years or 11 years on, I think we are at that inflection point in time. But I think from my perspective, it starts with data management, data analysis, because that at a teacher productivity and at a student outcome level is what gives you the prescriptive plan. And then the prescriptive plan gets into the world that a lot of you are from, which is cool stuff, innovative stuff, to Ed's point, absolutely engaging children. These are children that, that are growing up in a different society to the society we've grown up in. And frankly, I would also say these are all things that thematically are global. Mm -hmm. you know, I think sometimes the debate beats America up too much. Right? America's complicated, not only because of the stakeholders. It's three million people. It's mm -hmm. multi-ethnic. Right, it's multilingual, it's got some structural complexities to it that other countries don't have. I mean, you asked me earlier, what countries do it great? Finland does it great, Singapore does it great. If you believe great as metric by outcomes, and outcomes alone, by coincidence, they both tend to be nationalized systems that are, you know, it's procured and prescribed. They both have only level. about five million people. <laughs> and, they're both, and they're both an awful lot smaller. Right. And by the way, they're both largely, you know, homogenous right. from an ethnicity perspective, yeah. right? So we're comparing apples and bananas when we talk about we want to be like Singapore. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, you compare Singapore to Jamaica as countries of the same size GDP in the early 70s, and you can see how, you know, they can take diverging paths based upon an education system driving economic prosperity. So, look, I, I don't want to belabor the point, but I suppose the real point I would make is Mark's right. I love his passion. He's highlighting issues that talk to the cultural issue of kind of hopelessness and pessimism that sometimes beats this debate down because it lives or dies at the implementation I level. I think it's about creating, uh, like working backwards from the consumer. Mm -hmm. I agree Our consumer, that. in this case, is the student. <laughs> and, and building the product and engineering the solution around what the consumer's needs are. And building critical thinking consumers of what it is that they're consuming. And uh, uh, there's a lot of great product out there. There's a lot of great innovation mm -hmm. out there. Uh, uh, but there's a lot of roadblocks. Mm -hmm. And we have to, I think, fundamentally allow for the consumers to know that they're being denied maybe better solutions or more optimized solutions for the type of learner that they are. And uh, I think it's a uh, it's good time that we do that. And, you know, the, the intention of the, the, this unlimited justice platform is really designed to mainstream the dialogue and uh, so that we could have these kind of more macro conversations and take this vernacular that we use in, you know, in these kind of, uh, these kind of um, settings that are built around education reform and mainstream it so that, uh, you know, Look, a 14-year-old is, I don't know how old your boy is on Halo, but uh, there's a lot of best pra practices in the product design that the Halo designers did. Look, I'm, I, you know, my venture business, I'm in the social gaming business. The, the kind of metrics and analytics tools, the, the real-time testing and evaluation around narrative, it's meeting the user where they are at at what difficulty level, okay? That's a learning environment to me. It's not like, there's nothing new under the sun. It's not, like, it's not like the stuff is that exotic. It's just, is the system ready to allow the plug to be inserted and at a sufficient scale? And if not, will it be done on the margins on the outside uh, uh, in, in a manner where we create a pull from the consumers? And that's, what I, that's where I'm willing to go. That's why I think, uh, you know, that's yeah, why can, I am can I Can I just yep. add to that if you wouldn't, wouldn't mind? I, I completely agree with that. And, and frankly, for the entrepreneurs in the audience, so here's the opportunity. The commercial opportunity is there is no great education company today, globally. You know, There's we, no Apple of education. Correct. It's the, the line I use all the time. I mean, and frankly, Apple won't be the Apple of education nope. because by, very, by, by the virtue of what makes them brilliant, makes their DNA impossible to be institutionally, at least, in the school system. They may build great consumer education apps, which is a separate debate. But in terms of reforming our institutional education system, they won't be that company. So what I would say to the entrepreneurs in the audience is, I mean, Rupert Murdoch obviously believes he can build a great global education business because he believes and sees the tipping point, as does Ron Perlman with Scantron buying Global Scholar, as do I, frankly, in buying the assets that I've aggregated. But I think the opportunity for us, and we happen to have either scale in terms of the size of our businesses or in their situations, lots of capital, 
and indeed the, the opportunity for all of you as whether you're you know, startup entrepreneurs, angel investors, or indeed people running you know, decent sized businesses today is we're all part of the ecosystem of you know, I think a tipping point, a changing paradigm, and the ability for some, and it will, it'll be more than one company to rise up here and become a great education company. Because if there's no great education system in the world, there's also no great education company in the world. Ed, we've been talking a little bit about consumers and about education companies, but why does why do companies that aren't in the education space like AT&T care about this? And what, if anything, frankly, do you think they can do uh, to be important uh, in an education revolution? Well, a lot of us are part of pretty complex businesses. Um, you know, when, uh, at least in our case, designing and building wireless infrastructure is enormously uh, challenging. It requires... Um, individuals who can understand technology and business and social political issues and deal with marketing and you know all that kind of stuff um, for people to do that um, we need to be able to hire individuals who have pretty strong backgrounds strong educational backgrounds you don't just kind of walk into it you know how you know occasionally you'll meet somebody who um, you know, maybe uh, just sort of fell into a particular business and you know, may, maybe didn't require a lot of training. Um, in the business that we're in, you don't just fall into becoming a wireless system engineer. It just not, doesn't happen. You, you need uh, many years of training. And what we see is it's just becoming harder and harder and harder to bring young people into the business who have the right set of skills. And that translates into increased costs. That's why you know, our chairman has made a big deal out of this. We've spent millions and millions of dollars through our uh, AT&T Aspire program and so on and so forth. But, um, but you're absolutely right about, um, you know, businesses. A couple things that I heard in the discussion that I wanted to comment on. Uh, first off, I think that, uh, Mark, you're absolutely right, that basic safety issues um, in school, that's part of one of these things that you just assume. We were chatting earlier about... Um, youngsters, say, in the South Bronx, just trying to get to school, you know, get there uh, safely. It's sort of a, a close cousin to maybe being physically abused when mm -hmm. you're there. So I think everybody in the room agrees, and, you know, we're all uh, certainly uh, supporters of your notion. You also said something that I thought was kind of cool, and that's that uh, sometimes you bring technology into a classroom and teachers don't even know how to use it. Um, I, I vehemently agree with that, and I think that's part of the problem. In fact, the way they would get it to work is they ask one of the kids to get it to come up right. and work, right? I mean, that just, it just demonstrates this gulf that we have, this generational gulf between educators and all of us and youngsters who just think about the world differently, they process information differently, and if we don't adjust the way we do, you know, the innovative stuff, much less, the obviously, the basics, you don't get that right, forget it. You know, if it's an unsafe environment, you lose immediately. But assuming you can get that fixed, I really do think 2011 and forward is a time for this community to start thinking about ways to, to use uh, mobile broadband apps and devices and the internet and uh, video, I mean, uh, telepresence and other types of technologies into the learning environment. And I think what happens immediately is that youngsters start to notice th there's like a familiarity that they have with that it's like the that medium. It changes the, the whole game for the them. Yeah. yeah. Really is the way they think about I, the world. I think, though, the point Ed's teasing out, which is ultimately you know, a part of the conversation we should spend maybe just a couple of minutes on, which is an awful lot of these kind of innovative ideas in education live or die by the way in which they get implemented. And, you know, we've, had, we've seen great ideas go nowhere in education because they got poorly implemented. There were great ideas. I mean, people ahead of their time with various sorts of uh, innovative products and tools and offerings. And so, to my mind, once we get the kind of structural and, you know, tools in place, and once we kind of culturally, you know, invigorate the teaching community that really this is a moment in time and things can be different, then I think there's a whole separate tactical, more tactical conversation around how do we implement it and roll it out. And that's where, again, I think the stakeholders need to come together. And, you know, of course, you can have one stakeholder that can always try and derail it. I mean, you know, historically, the unions always get blamed. But certainly in our dialogue, my, my finding is pretty much across the board, all stakeholders recognize status quo is unacceptable. It needs to change. We can pretty much agree pretty quickly on how to change it, but then how do you implement it and scale it and grassroot it and then test it, you know, and it becomes systemic. 
I mean, that's the word, really. I mean, it's it, it needs to be systemic. Otherwise, it's, it is just another cyclical blip. I, I'm going to uh, come to the audience for questions and comments in, in just a second. So if you have questions or comments, um, uh, please get them ready. Uh, Mark, did you see uh, the, the, uh, the movie Waiting for Superman? Did you yes, see I the did. Documentary? Uh, what did you think about that? And what, if any, uh, uh, yeah, what did you think about that? Is that w was that helpful in, in moving us to where we are and maybe moving us forward? Was that hurtful? Was that just was another hurtful. movie that comes and goes? I, yeah, I don't think it was hurtful. I don't think it was, and I love Davis. I think he's a, a brilliant, you know, storyteller. And, uh, and uh, I, I, I do, I, I, just, I don't think it was the uh, inconvenient truth moment that we were all hoping for. Um, what, why do you know? Well, why, I think why it, I think it, it reduced the dialogue. It overly simplified the dialogue around this conversation of charter versus, you know, non-charter. And frankly, that's just inside baseball talk. I mean, you speak to mainstream folks. I, I was at <laughs> an, an opening for for it, and I was sitting next to someone who you know who was from a major Fortune 50 technology company marketing person. The movie ended. I said, what'd you think? And I said, you know, I said, I, I, and she said, I thought it was good. I said, you know, uh, it, it just makes it, the conversation is just too simple, like, you know, making the charter thing. And she didn't understand what charter schools were after watching the movie. Okay, so the, it, it was very well inten uh, intended. Uh, and I think uh, in the the, the body of work that the Gates folks have done and through their generosity and their, and their tenacity and also this kind of precarious position and he, you know, he's like an ambassador like he, can't be too, he can't have his teeth out too much he's got to be politically diplomatic and he's trying to push it but he's, he, he's on maybe a slightly different pace um, great movie that was called The Lottery I don't know if any of you folks saw it it was uh, about the New Jersey educational system uh, there, uh, I'm sorry, it was called The Cartel. And then there was The Lottery, which was a Madeline Sackler flick, which was uh, followed Ava Moskowitz and uh, kind of a similar kind of product in the end. Uh, but the conversation's more dynamic and there's more moving parts. And we, you know, that's why I was particular, I was partial to the movie The Cartel. If anyone didn't see it, I recommend uh, it uh, highly. It's very interesting when you when you say that about uh, uh, about Bill Gates, you make me think about the conversation that happened a lot in the '60s and '70s about Dr. King and Malcolm X, and the notion that you needed different strong personalities and points of view to move things forward. That one of them on their own yeah, may yeah. not have been enough. Uh, right. Not trying to reduce it to just those two, but just but that but that they each ultimately needed each other in a sense to help. Uh, create a dynamic that um, that helped change the conversation. Um, let's turn to some uh, questions and comments. Um, if you'd, uh, I'm not sure if we have microphones, so if we don't, I'll just ask you to uh, to stand up and uh, introduce yourself and enunciate. Okay, great. W would you would you give your name and 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 who you're directing the question to, and then your question, please. Kathleen Whitmire with the National Center for Learning Disabilities, and actually I'd like a, a short response from all three if possible. I want to thank you all for saying this has to be changed. I want to thank Mark for saying where is the urgency. These are excellent points that we all need to be hearing. My question is, when you are looking at a publicly funded, publicly established, publicly regulated institution like education, how can you force that change? Where, where, where is the leverage point? How are we going to make that happen so that we're not coming up with the over-simplistic statements that Mark just nailed so well and with such a complex system? How are we going to turn that around? Who wants to kick it off? Barry, you ready to give your short? Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, the, the short, simple answer is money. You tie funding to performance. That's my simple answer. I think it's uh, more critical thinking consumers, votes. We uh, consume at the polling box. Uh, we've proved once before that we could uh, um, rally youth vote. We've done it before. I think we got to put more pressure in a, in, a, in a way that's sufficiently apolitical 
so it doesn't look like a, a witch hunt for against Republicans or or against uh, Dems, because this is something that we should all just, you know, regardless of our tribal affinity, uh, uh, agree to. It needs to get fixed. Somebody said something really interesting uh, last night at a dinner. Uh, wondered whether. Um, express admiration for a lot of the ideas and a lot of the policies that Michelle Re pushed, uh, had some critique maybe of her style, but ultimately wondered whether her opportunity going forward was to be that tree shaker mm -hmm. um, on a national level. And the comparison, and again, I'm, I'm largely paraphrasing the language that was used, but does she, and, and the language was used complementary in a complementary fashion, does she have the opportunity to be the Sarah Palin of, of education reform, meaning that Sarah Palin uh, a has, lightning rod. Has, has not only been a lightning rod, but able to do more effectively pick than most people winners and losers, yeah. right? So the ability to actually influence a race in South Carolina or Alabama or other parts and to do it after a relatively short time on the national stage, very few people have had that ability. And yeah. so the question was, you know, was there that opportunity for Michelle Rhee or someone else to, to your point about waiting for Superman, um, to be Superwoman? <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Ed, you want to jump you know, in here? I, I think it's a great question. You know, had this question of how do we influence sort of a government-controlled um, uh, public entity? I, I would say in certain sectors, like if you decided, if the people in this room decided that collectively we had some opinion about the way the U.S. Air Force should operate, there's probably not a lot that we can do to go affect that opinion anywhere. Um, it's just, there's no forum for that. But education is different, right? I mean, it, one of the things that's great about education is that probably the most powerful seat, you know, that you can hold is, a parent, is being a parent and having children. And maybe a close cousin to that is to get involved in your community. I went out and ran for school board because I wanted to be involved in our educational uh, uh, process in our, in our town. And I think that we made some difference. I, I, I think education really is one of those unique things where you can affect change. Now, that said, I'm going to suggest something that I hope doesn't happen. And that's that... Again, I think generationally most of us are probably pretty comfortable with the way information is conveyed in the classroom because that's the way we grew up. And in my case, I'm old. I'm you know, in my late 40s, so when I see a classroom, that looks normal to me. My kids, I suspect, when they're sitting here on these panels and talking, they won't stand for it. And I think if we don't change things, they will. Now, I don't want to wait. I said a minute ago what I hope doesn't happen is I hope we don't have to wait for the next generation for our children to be sitting here saying, this is ridiculous. This is not the way to teach math, having somebody standing at a blackboard and everybody working through some problems and every kid in the room working at a different pace and the kids are really good at it. They get finished and they go read a book and the ones are bad. They don't. We know that's wrong, but that's what we were all subjected to, so we still do that. Um, it will change, and the fact that you know education being one of the things all of us can get involved in immediately is going to make it go that much more quickly. But a pessimistic view might be that the urgency may not be there, and we're just going to have to wait for the next generation to come, and I guarantee you they will change it. They will completely trash and, and overhaul the way we do education in this country, I guarantee it. Um, you, you know, that, that question about uh, urgency, wait, how many of you have ever read uh, Dr. King's Why We Can't Wait? Um, if you haven't read it, that whole question of the fierce urgency of now is, is, is really interesting and in how you prompt um, uh, uh, urgency on an issue that seems large and intractable and seems like it's been around for a long time. You know, very interesting, including some of his... Uh, his last speeches. I think we have a, a question over here. We'll probably we'll take one more after that, uh, time-wise. Uh, thank you. I'm Dana Stewart. I'm with a company called SESI, leading provider of private special ed schools around the country. Wanted to just highlight uh, a concept 
uh, that I think one of the reasons we're all here and the mix of people are here, which was blown off multiple times this morning, which is the for-profit sector needs to be at the table. There are multiple examples of alternative education schools that graduate regularly, 90 plus percent of their students in a, in a market where the district allows a for-profit with certain performance metrics to participate. And it's never allowed to participate in the I-3. It's not allowed to contract in most school districts. And, you know, I would say uh, it's an issue of engagement. And, uh, oh, man. So to, to Mark's uh, point earlier, and I think I've seen your product, by the way, and um, for, through your sweat equity company. Thank and you. I think that it is exactly the kind of thing we need, which is engage the kids, connect the dots. Why do we have to learn math? Why do we have to learn science? Why do I have to have a degree? Why should I finish high school? Why should I be part of a team? Public schools, uh, unfortunately, are mostly incapable of communicating that information and spreading a culture of positive, uh, positivity, safety, uh, a place where kids feel like they can learn and want to learn. You know, the foreign countries are doing a great job, but most of those people are fighting to the death to get out of there and come to the U.S. where they can be safe and have a future. We have a different um, motivation to learn here. And until we can engage these kids and connect the dots, and I would argue that the private sector, unless they can get to the table and be a part of that conversation, with the same performance metrics and pay scale that the schools get, which somehow they're afraid of, I don't think we're going to see the kind of change that we need to in this country. You guys, I'm going to have to actually uh, 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 breach what I said before. So real quick comment here just so we can get one other question in. So if any of you want to jump in on this uh, really quickly and add a comment, and then I'm going to go do uh, it's, I always uh, say, like, teach uh, instead of, you know, look, I, I don't want you guys to walk away from this thinking that I'm some kind of, like, anarchist or something. Because I'm not. I, I, I actually uh, I, I believe in rigor, and I, I believe in the importance of uh, socializing, tests, and comp competition, and all that. Um, but it's interesting. I, around sweat equity education, uh, I always say, you know, let's just design a curriculum rather than teaching to a test. Let's teach to the open hire, because not everyone's a great test taker, but they might be a good employee. And we, we got to really start thinking about, like, is our educational system at the least, at the very least, Pythagorean theorem aside, is it teaching them how to take care of themselves and to be self-productive uh, uh, and, and, and live a, a, a life where they can reconcile uh, and problem solve in, in a way that's sensible and independent? And that's, that's what uh, uh, I think it's, uh, it's about. And can I selfishly just take two moments? Sure. For, for anyone uh, who wants to chat more about unlimited justice, because uh, I honestly am, you know, if you don't ask, if you don't open your mouth, you, you know, you, you don't get fed. Um, uh, some of my staff is over here. Uh, there's uh, Mike Schreibman, uh, who's actually the CEO of uh, um, Sweat Equity Education. Letitia is here uh, from Unlimited Justice. Uh, Ira Sokowitz, uh, who works here in D.C. for me on this initiative, getting in front of legislators uh, on a state-by-state -state and also in front of you know, federal legislators. I, I just wanted to point those folks out because I might not be able to, and it would be great to be able to chat with all you guys. And, and hopefully some of you want more info. We've got handouts here. So please, I need stakeholders. Uh, great. Uh, we'll take one more question all the way there uh, in the back, and then uh, final comments from uh, each person here. Hi. My question is simple. Why not go directly to the consumers? I work at a school in the Bronx. I know it's challenging dealing with districts. There are many products that I saw today that I would love. However, they are not a vendor with New York City, there is a monopoly, and I can buck the system. So my question is to the nonprofits, for-profits, venture um, organizations, why not go directly to 14 to 21-year-old high school students, offer them an opportunity to use your products, create a demand so you can change the structure? Because if you are trying to change the structure, 
you're going to be fighting the status quo and they're not going to buck. So why or you're, you're using... going to end up changing the product to or, meet, the, the, to meet right. the middle. And get direct feedback from the consumers, which are the youth that really is totally disconnected with what is currently being offered in the public school system. So that's my question to the panel. Why not go directly to the consumer, which are the students, a billion strong, and let them drive and create the grassroots needs to change the structures? Barry, I'm going to let you hit that real quick, and then, and then, uh, and then Ed, we'll kick off with you and ask everyone to make final comments. Sure. Uh, I mean, that, that's a great point. In fact, it, it, we agree with it, which is why we set up a consumer division last year. I mean, we've got 12 million unique visitors a month coming to our various sites using ver an awful lot of our programs online. A lot of that's school-based, some of it's home-based, and we believe that the Internet is now allowing you to distribute these products direct to the consumer in a way that through retail, you know, you didn't make any economic sense. So we, we completely agree with you, and we think it will create, to Ed's point, this kind of collaborative use, usage uh, and ultimately a kind of an academic you know, social media community of users. So we just built a whole bunch of apps for, uh, for iPad and, for, and for, for, um, for the iPhone. We just launched, we're just about to launch uh, three different um, apps for, um, for Facebook. So we believe that you know, education companies, big and small, should be part of the global education community. And going direct to the consumer is the right way to create that. Um, so final thoughts, guys, this has been terrific. Time has, has gone by really quickly. And final thoughts as you think about whether or not this is a tipping point moment and, and where we go from here. And we'll go Ed, uh, we'll go Mark, and then Barry will let you finish up. Sure. Um, I think it's obvious that it's a tipping point moment. I mean, sort of uh, it's on behalf of AT&T and our chairman and all the folks here from AT&T, um, we see this as very compatible with our business interests. I mean, um, there's wonderful opportunity here. It feels good to be working in that area. And I hope the next few years we attend to all these basic matters. I hope we, you know, focus on some of the basics that we heard Mark talk about, but even, uh, you know, as importantly, start to rethink the way we use technology and networks and systems and devices to incorporate better ways to communicate with youngsters because as a parent, as a, you know, as a, uh, you know, in, in the case of the Board of Education, a public servant, as a professor for 20 years and as an executive in business, I can tell you that what we're doing right now is probably not working as well as it should. Yeah, I, I, look, uh, if I got anything to do with it, I will help the, the point tip. Um, so I, I'm doing whatever I can, albeit incremental, uh, you know, trying to climb the ladder and, and help, you know, bring folks with me and, 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 and you know, uh, uh, in, in, at the same time, go tag my wagon with some folks that are really fighting to make, make a difference. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm hopeful. I mean, it's kind of obvious. Um, and now it's really up to the adults in the room. To, uh, um, to figure it out, and to the legislators, to figure it out. You know, just uh, that's, that's where I'm at. And um, I, wanted, I just want to shout out uh, the Aspen Institute for making this happen and get everybody in the room like this, and to Jim Shelton. I just want to uh, give him Big an hand. applause. Um, uh, and the, this administration, you know, because I've been in this for a minute, uh, regardless of your thoughts on this administration or not, and I'm not here to, to, to have a political conversation, but uh, I'm just happy that the, these conversations are happening. That there, there's now a, 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 it's in the air. And uh, for that, I'm very grateful. Uh, and uh, I, I'm grateful that they asked me to be here today. So thank you. Barry, you get the final word. Yeah, just, just to conclude, I completely echo Mark's sentiments regarding thanking the Aspen Institute and the DOE. I think it's a great opportunity, a great forum, and a very different dialogue to a lot of these things, you know, the way these things tend to be. Uh, it's more transparent, and I think it's a bit more provocative and good. I think that speaks to the, the theme and the climate of, of, and the urgency, frankly, of needing to change. I mean, just, again, to, if I could conclude with a little bit of company propaganda, you know, we're big. We do publish more books than anybody else in this country, but we also publish a lot of software. We do platforms. We do professional development. We do have a professional service, the School Improvement Group. Uh, and, frankly, we are your friend, not your enemy. So if you have a small company, if you're an individual, if you've got limited capital, if you've got limited scale from a 
distribution perspective, we would love to talk to you because we strongly believe that it takes an ecosystem of lots of different individuals and a community orientation to really change the paradigm and deliver great education, and we'd love to talk to you about it. So thank you. Uh, folks, please give a big hand for Dr. Ed Amoroso from AT&T, Barry O'Callaghan, Chief Executive of Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, and Mark Echo of Sweat Equity Education. Thank you. Do you want to paddle back? Yeah, give me my paddle. Give me my paddle. A special thank you once again to all of our panelists. Ladies and gentlemen, in just a few moments, our second round of breakout sessions will begin. We would also invite you to please visit, visit the exhibit booths. Each exhibit has been carefully selected to be a part of our program and are showcasing valuable opportunities and innovations for education. We are very proud to share these exhibits with you, and your experience today is certainly not complete without paying them a visit. Our breakout sessions begin in just a few moments.